GRC or Governance, Risk, and Compliance provides the basis of a security program for the organization. Governance within GRC sets the ultimate tone and objectives of the security program. Ultimately, governance ensures accountability within the security program. As you might expect, when you're in a large organization, there's multiple people, personalities, everybody has their own objective agenda and thinks they know the best way to solve a problem. Many of them do probably know the best way to solve a problem. But the problem with that is that might not be in line with the business goals and objectives. Ultimately, how does the business make money? In security, we exist to support that fact. We secure the organization so it can make money without risk or harm to its business that makes it money, its brand and reputation. So governance, which is handled and carried out by an executive, ensures that the organization stays in line with what those business objectives are and more importantly, within the budget that is provided to them for security. We can think of what happens when there is no governance. We've been in a classroom when the teacher leaves for an extended period of time, it devolves into chaos. An organization lacking governance will devolve into random attempts at securing and managing risks in a haphazard way. So everything we've talked about up until this point, risk assessments, analysis, solving problems, about cybersecurity and what the threats are to the organization can be done, but there is no cohesiveness in how that is accomplished and to what direction we all march to ensure that it is in line with those objectives that the organization set out. As I mentioned previously, governance is managed by an executive within the organization. Traditionally, it's going to be a chief information officer or chief information security officer, but it could be also a chief technology officer or a chief security officer. And really, that all depends on the organization, how they're structured, what their goals are, and the personalities that operate that business. In the end, it's an it depends answer. However, usually most large organizations have a CIO, and under the CIO, you will find a CISO. A CISO usually reports to a CIO, and the CIO conveys the cyber risks to the organization to the other executives on the board. I think there's nothing more that can be said about this at this point in time other than without governance, there is no security program. A program requires planning, preparation, people, and process. And without governance, it's unlikely a security program could get off the ground and be cohesive at identifying, managing, and responding to organizational risk at a process, informational, and technological standpoint. So governance requires a strategy. And essentially, the strategy is to identify and evaluate some key different things that the organization must account for. First being the organizational risk acceptance, which we've talked a little bit about previously. How does the organization manage and accept or mitigate risk? What do they do when they're presented with a risky situation or they want to conduct some line of business that poses an inherent risk? They've got to have a policy and a matrix in determining how they respond to that risk. The strategy must identify how this plan of securing the organization integrates well with the business. We've talked a little bit about how businesses have different business units, different organizational structure, they have different funding lines, and ultimately what this means is, is there's a division of decision making and how we respond to certain activities. We can't simply force security on the organization. We have to get customer buy-in. A lot of discussions you will see when you talk to executives, uh, security leaders and managers in an organization is they start referring to other business units as customers. We security provide a service to our customers who are also our colleagues and they work at the same organization. And it is our job to ensure that our security strategies do not hinder their ability to conduct business. Now, what degree do we determine is not hinder? Well, that's up for debate because a lot of things security wants to do, uh, most users and other business lines consider a hindrance. So that is a huge point of contention in larger organizations, managing that integration, getting customer buy-in, and getting the support needed to cause real change in security for the better. What are the cyber mitigation approaches? In the strategy, we identify our risk, how we accept the risk, how we're going to integrate, but none of that can happen if we don't have a budget and resources. Where do we spend and use those resources? 
Do we hire more people? Do we buy better technology? Do we enforce more compliance or policies on the organization or a combination of all three? There is no one right answer. It's another it depends response. It depends on the organization, their risk posture, how they handle things, their decision-making process, and of course their budget resources and support from within the organization. Again, security needs governance beyond just our CISO or CIO. If the CEO or the CFO, chief financial officer, does not support security, you can kiss a good funding line away. A side note is you will usually see security organizations get flush with cash and a good budget once the chief financial officer was targeted in a breach. This usually occurs a lot where a CFO is whaled, where they're um, sent malicious emails or spam to try to trick the CFO into divulging information that might lead to theft of resources of the organization, money, or insight on negotiations and contracts and anything there uh, that you might expect a CFO to have their hands in. Uh, but, but it's very commonplace to see a security organization get a lot of money after the CFO is targeted. Strategy is shaped by how the organization handles decisions or what their decision-making agility is. And really what this boils down to is how bureaucratic is the organization. Do we have policies in place that allow our frontline security engineers and analysts to take action if a certain event occurs? If yes, we have very quick decision-making agility. We've empowered people that are at the right place and right time to take action. And because we've given them that authority to take action, we'll have their back, right? There's another benefit of having good governance is also providing top cover for your organization and giving them the tools to make decisions and take action. Um, but again, is the organization really bureaucratic? Does everything require, I've got to talk to my boss to get, you know, to get approval on this? Um, not saying that that's the wrong way to do things, but there's definitely key risk areas in an organization where we need to provide policy and the authority for those that are in the right place at the right time to take action when it's needed. So there can be a mix between we still have to have our processes for approval but where it counts and matters when it comes to high risky situations or critical assets, people need to be able to take action to protect the business. And ultimately, we hope that businesses see that people doing this work at that point in time are doing it to protect the brand, protect the business, and, and uh, they're getting that top cover that they need. That might not always be the case, but that definitely has to be taken into consideration when building a governance strategy. How do we manage risk? How do we deal with it? And do I give my people the appropriate leeway to take action if necessary? Lastly, governance strategy isn't going anywhere if we don't have real-time or near real-time data about what risk the organization faces and the analytics or data that tells us how we're doing against our known or unknown threats, uh, which now become known threats once we, of course, identify them. But if we don't have visibility into that process, we can't verify that our strategy is working. We can't make changes in the strategy to account for those changes in risk profiles. Uh, and if we're not doing that, all the work prior in that strategy development really falls on the floor. So we've got to have good data. We've got to have good integration. So that might mean technology people and process have to be put in place solely for risk monitoring and analysis to support governance strategy and alignment. So fret not, it's not like you're gonna go work in an organization and you're gonna go work on a GRC team, which that is a component of some larger organizations. They might have an official GRC team. And uh, within that team, they work on all of these things, policies, organizational risk, strategy, security implementations, pros, cons, budgets, people process technology, all of it is, is brought up into the GRC team for analysis and to support the executive leadership in their decision making. Uh, but you don't have to go in alone and make it from scratch. There's tons of resiliency frameworks that help assess where your organization is and where you need to be. It helps you assess your technology, how that technology is configured, how are you staffed? How are those people applied and how effective it is? And what processes do you have in place and how do those processes affect overall security posture? So with a good resiliency framework, we're able to define where we can improve, which helps again reinforce what our strategy needs to be. And we can begin to adjust our strategy as we start accomplishing those goals within these resiliency frameworks.
So as I said, there exists multiple resiliency frameworks, but the one we're going to sort of talk about first and foremost here is the one from NIST, which is the National Institute for Standards and Technology. NIST has hundreds of reports and standards that you can go look up online that help you understand many different things in regards to cybersecurity, information security, and many other areas where standards and technology might be applied in relation to government uh, standards and objectives. NIST works hand in hand with many commercial and private sector partners to define standards and how these standards can be applied to technology and how they should be used or what best business practices should be applied to get those to be most effective. So we're going to talk a little bit about the cybersecurity framework by NIST. It helps identify where we are at as an organization from a security program standpoint and where we can be by implementing security controls and technologies, people, and process. One thing to note is the framework is broken down into tiers for rating ourselves, and there's core standards to be somewhat, or I would say minimally compliant with the cybersecurity framework. So let's dive in a little bit more on the cybersecurity framework from NIST. So as we just talked about, the cybersecurity framework provides insight into core requirements that an organization must meet to be considered sort of a tier one level or your lowest level of compliance with the cyber framework. We can see it's broken down into multiple functions. How does an organization identify risk and handle that risk? How do we protect our assets? How do we detect anomalies, events, security issues, and malicious activity? How do we respond to those events, which effectively means how do you stop them from occurring? And then how do we recover? How do we take uh, a state of breach where our systems are compromised and they've been abused? And how do I recover them to a prior attack state or a prior compromise state? Each category can be broken down into subcategories. And these subcategories give us subtasks that we must align our security program to, to be compliant within the cybersecurity framework. So we can see an example here of these subcategories. They have their own category codes. And then we get informative references. These references are actually referencing other cyber resiliency framework standards. We have ones from ISO, COBIT, and again, NIST, which is the, the namesake here one, NIST SP853. So that is the cyber resiliency framework we're going to talk about a little bit more. So we understand how our organization aligns with the core functions, what categories do we satisfy, and then to what degree. To what degree we satisfy those requirements help determines which tier we fall within. So are we a tier one partial, tier two risk informed, tier three repeatable, tier four adaptive? So let's break that down a little bit more. Tier one partial, simply means that you somewhat are in line with the requirement. So let's look at an example here, IDBE1 in that subcategory listing, the organization's role in the supply chain is identified and communicated. So this is in the identify function or core category. So it simply means where is our organization's role in the supply chain? How do we affect the supply chain or how are we affected by the supply chain? Supply chain simply meaning how are our products sold or how do we receive products and services? There is always a risk of our product being intercepted before it goes to a customer or what if malicious software is injected in our software before we ship it out? What if we buy a product from a supplier and that product is compromised before we bring it into the organization? So we might say we are tier one partial if that is not fully fleshed out. If we do not have a complete mapping of how our organization fits within the supply chain, both us selling products and services and also receiving products and services. If we do not have that fully mapped out, we might not be compliant at all, but if we are partially adhering to that subcategory requirement, we could say we're partial. Tier two, risk informed, looking at that same one, we've got it fully mapped out and we have enough awareness to understand where our risks are in relation to our supply chain. What risks do we face from our supply chain for selling software and services? And what are the risks of us bringing in software and services from a third party? 
Repeatable simply means we have a repeatable process to assess security and respond and mitigate to security. So when reviewing our organization's role within the supply chain, do we have a repeatable process for assessing and responding to that risk? Which also means monitoring and analyzing it. If the answer is yes, we're tier three, we're repeatable. Tier four, adaptive. And just like it sounds, we're beyond the point where we just have a repeatable process. We have the skill, staff, and processes to be able to adapt to new changes, new risks, new techniques, new threats. We can account for them, include them in our process, and keep moving in a repeatable process. So once you get to the point where you're able to adapt to change and fix and move and align the organization or this subcategory in that direction you want to go, you're at that repeatable state or an adaptive state, I should say. So looking at any subcategory in the cybersecurity risk framework, you need to review the organization. Where are you? Are you barely compliant with the requirement? Are you able to assess risk? Are you able to assess risk, monitor it, adjust risk, and mitigate it accordingly? Or are you going beyond just assessing and responding to risk? You can account for new risks and incorporate that into your risk profile without it having any hindrance to your business operations and security. So you may be thinking, that's all well and good, but what does that actually mean? How do we document our organization's role or how do we assess risk and then rate it to this four tier standard? So if you remember in the last slide, it referenced those subcategories, which provided a reference cyber resiliency framework. And in this example, we're gonna use NIST 853, which provide a listing of security controls or control families, and what we need to do to be compliant or adhere to what this security control is looking for. So the example here, we're looking at unsuccessful logon attempts, and we can see that it provides a controlled description. What does this mean? And essentially it says we enforce a limit in which when there's a certain number of unsuccessful logon attempts, we take some action. We block the account, we raise an alert, we might disable the account. Now, when we look at the access control family listing, we can see that there's priorities, a priority one, priority two. And this helps us assess which things should we do before the others but then it allows us to have this low, moderate, and high. Within our organizational risk structure, where do we need to apply this? If we are only worried about low priorities, we can look at all of the ones that are identified in the low column. So we can see that looking here, we can see access control policy and procedures is something that we should do if we want to have a low compliance to the cyber resiliency or uh, control framework. Uh, we should need to have account management as a low priority, access enforcement, unsuccessful login attempts, system use notification. So just in this list, we've got just a few things that we should be doing at a minimum in the lowest degree possible to provide or adhere to this NIST 853 control framework. Now, when we look at moderate and high, we can see that that definitely changes as far as what controls must be applied to meet a moderate or high resiliency within this NIST cybersecurity framework.